So without further ado, I'll introduce you to our two speakers. Um, Juan Cardenas is a Colombian writer, translator, and critic, uh, notably translator of Thomas Wolfe, our hometown literary hero, um, <clears throat> as well as William Faulkner, Machado de Assis, plenty of others. Um, we'll be discussing his novel, Ornamental, translated by Lizzie Davis, who is a translator and editor at Coffeehouse Press, whose translation of, what is it, Las Maravillas, is forthcoming with Thomas Brimstead from Pushkin Press. So I'll hand you over to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm actually really enjoying seeing people's faces, so feel free to turn your video on if you wish. We're going to start with a little reading um, and then do some questions and then go from there. So Juan, do you want to start? Sure. Um... Uh, do you want me to start with section, that would be 12, was it, the first one? Yes. Sorry. Yes, sure. sorry. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, I'll read in Spanish first, and um, then Lizzie will read her beautiful uh, translation. And uh, so here we go. Uh, this is section 12 of Ornamental in Spanish. It goes like this. Um, Día de guayabo descomunal en la cama. Dolor de cabeza, náuseas, ganas de morirme, baja autoestima, malos presagios injustificados. La vida te sonríe, me repito, pero yo sé que es inútil. Cierro los ojos y la cabeza se me llena de imágenes malas. Augurio, agüero, cucaracha, ratón, los gerentes, laureano, gaitán, gaitán, el palacio del colesterol, un tamal bomba. Me toca separar lo comestible de los trozos de metralla, clavos, tornillos, tuercas, vidrio. El tamal explota al pie de las estatuas. Quitar los ídolos y poner las imágenes. ¿No era de Hernán Cortés esa frase? Mi mujer se levantó temprano porque tenía que ir a terminar con el montaje de su exposición en la galería. La inauguración es en dos días. Yo me revuelco en la autocompasión de las sábanas pegajosas y duermo mal por trechos. Al mediodía me levanto, me ducho, me afeito. Confirmo en Google que la frase es de Hernán Cortés. Desayuno copiosamente y mientras busco algo para leer entre los muchos libros de mi mujer, recuerdo una frase que me decía mi padre para reprocharme mi holgazanería. Usted desayuna y queda desocupado. Siempre fui un holgazán desde niño. Y nada, ni siquiera la estricta educación consiguió infundirme ningún sentimiento de culpa ante la pereza. Soy impunemente holgazán y creo que, a diferencia de lo que mi padre pensaba, mi estilo de vida se ajusta muy bien a los modos de producción de nuestros tiempos. Es posible que hasta mi resaca sea un mecanismo desviado de colaborar con el sistema, Alguien debe de estar llenándose los bolsillos a costa de mi malestar ahora mismo. Vaya a saber cómo. En los días que corren nadie sabe muy bien cómo se crea el dinero. Lo dice mi mujer bien claro. Hay que negarse a hacer, vivir en la poética de la inacción. Y entonces te caen los millones. Should I stop there? Is here. You want me to keep going until the... Ah, oh, just, just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit, yeah, sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Trato de leer una novela y no puedo pasar de las primeras líneas. Recostado en el sofá, me quedo dormido. Sueño con las mujeres del laboratorio, un sueño que olvido al despertar cuando empieza a caer la tarde. Beautiful. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. All right. Day spent in bed with a colossal hangover. Headache, nausea, a desire to die, low self-esteem, disproportionately bad omens. The universe smiles upon you, I repeat to myself, but it's no use. I close my eyes and my head fills with unsavory images, portent, augury, cockroach, mouse, the directors, Loreano Gaetan Gaetan, the cholesterol palace, a loaded tamal, it falls on me to separate what's edible from bits of shrapnel, nails, bolts, screws, glass. The tamal explodes right at the foot of the statuary, tear down the idols and raise the icons. 
Wasn't that Hernán Cortés? My wife got up early and went to the gallery to finish mounting her show. The opening is in two days. I wallow in self-pity in the sticky sheets, sleeping poorly at intervals. Around noon, I get up, shower, and shave. I Google the phrase and confirm that it's Hernán Cortés. I breakfast copiously, and while looking for something to read among my wife's many books, I remember what my father used to say to reproach me for my idleness. You fuel up for the day just to sit back down and do nothing. I've always been a slacker ever since I was a child and nothing, not even a strict education has managed to inspire a shred of guilt in me for it. I'm a deadbeat with impunity. And I'm convinced that contrary to what my father believed, my lifestyle is very well suited to today's modes of production. Even my hangover could be an oblique form of cooperation with the system. At this very moment, someone's pockets must be filling up at the expense of my malaise, though I couldn't say how exactly. These days, no one really knows how money is made. My wife says it clearly enough. One must refuse to do, must reside in the poetics of inaction, and then millions will rain down upon you. I try to read a novel and can't get past the first lines. Lying back on the sofa, I fall asleep and dream of the women at the lab, a dream I forget upon waking as the sun begins to set. Awesome. So here's section 14 in Spanish. Cena en el apartamento de los gerentes para celebrar el lanzamiento del nuevo producto. Nos acompañan a la mesa unos inversores nuevos, dos mocosos insufribles. La conversación no se puede aguantar. Procuro no dejarme afectar por la frivolidad, pero la frivolidad siempre es más fuerte que la templanza, sobre todo si uno es una persona atenta a los detalles. Otra de las tristes herencias del barroco de los narcos fue la propensión a la hipérbole, a los gestos enfáticos, a los marcadores de poder con letrero de neón y música incorporada. Y la conducta de estas personas es una extraña vuelta de tuerca a ese juego de ostentaciones. Su actitud oculta el mal gusto narco bajo un manto minimalista, el diseño como un pellejo falso del viejo animal barroco, la exuberancia de la catedral embutida en un cubo de paneles monocromáticos. La violencia que se respira en la mesa es producto de ese ejercicio de represión post. Para el olfato de un perro, aquí se estaría librando una guerra química entre las lociones y los humores corporales. Me pregunto entonces si mi propio gusto no será una forma superior de represión, como una capa de diseño por encima de la capa de diseño donde estos cuatro estúpidos se huelen los pedos. Un ambiente denso que solo puedo soportar gracias a mi largo entrenamiento basado en la sonrisa automática y el aforismo. El otro motivo de celebración es que los gerentes, valiéndose de su larga pezuña en el Congreso de la República, han conseguido tumbar un proyecto de ley que pretendía regular la venta de drogas duras, un paso previo a la legalización total. Proponen un brindis por el certero golpe de pasillo y brindamos claro porque eso nos garantiza la continuidad de los dividendos del negocio y la posibilidad de dilatar la temida reestructuración que exigiría un escenario donde el consumo y el tráfico fueran completamente legales. Me pregunto si en semejante escenario mi trabajo dejaría de ser considerado una aberración. Quizá mi mujer y yo ocuparíamos el mismo nicho ecológico, algo así como diseñadores de estados de ánimo artificiales. Quizá yo merezco por derecho propio el mote de artista, tanto como ella. Uno de los gerentes, el que no tiene veleidades intelectuales, está deseoso de contar los detalles escabrosos de la negociación con los congresistas. El otro le da un golpecito con el codo y propone un nuevo brindis. Por el nuevo producto que, por cierto, dice, todavía no hemos bautizado. ¿Alguna sugerencia? Los nuevos inversores proponen nombres con resonancias angélicas y celestiales. Por, al, por algún lado sale lo reprimido. Yo detesto ponerle nombre a mis criaturas, así que me limito a aplaudir todas las iniciativas. 
Dinner at the director's place to celebrate the launch of the new product. We're joined at the table by two new investors, both insufferable brats. The conversation is intolerable. I try to resist the puerile exchange, but frivolity is always stronger than temperance, above all if one is attentive to details. Another sad legacy of the narco-baroque period was a propensity for hyperbole, for emphatic gestures, for scoreboards flashing power in neon with built-in speakers, of course. And the way these people behave puts a twist on that game of ostentations. They conceal the narco's characteristic bad taste beneath a mantle of minimalism, a fake hide they designed for the old Baroque animal, the cathedral's flamboyant stuffed into a cube of monochromatic panels. The violence in the air is the product of that post-Baroque exercise in repression. Here, to the canine nose, a chemical war is unfolding between aftershave lotions and bodily humors. I wonder then, wouldn't that make my own taste a superior form of repression, another layer removed from the one where these four idiots breathe in one another's noxious fumes? A dense atmosphere I can only endure thanks to my thorough training in mechanized smiling and aphorism. The second cause for celebration is that the managers, availing themselves of their far-reaching paws in Congress, have succeeded in toppling a bill that aimed to regulate the sale of hard drugs, a precursor to total legalization. They propose a toast to the well-timed coup. And we toast, of course, because this guarantees us continued dividends from the business and will likely delay the dreaded overhaul that would completely legalize both consumption and trafficking. I wonder if under such circumstances, my job would no longer be considered an aberration. Maybe my wife and I would occupy the same ecological niche, something like designers of artificial emotional states. Maybe I, in my own right, merit the title of artist, just as she does. One of the directors, the one without intellectual aspirations, wants to tell us the salacious details of their negotiation with the congressman. His brother leans over to squeeze his elbow and proposes another toast. To the new product, which, by the way, has yet to be christened, he says. Any ideas? The new investors propose names with angelic celestial echoes. What we repress finds its way out somehow. I detest naming my creatures and so limit myself to applauding each initiative. Now we go with section 15. Me yeah. conmueve. Shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Unless you have a different idea. Oh, no. <laughs> oh? I think that's perfect. Good. <laughs> Me conmueve el tono pausado, la dicción precisa con la que número cuatro produce sus discursos. Tanto más sabiendo que es mi droga la que desencadena todo eso. Hoy le he enseñado a mi mujer las transcripciones y ella ha comentado de manera esquiva, sin medir las palabras, que aquello tenía su gracia. Me pareció curioso que hubiera empleado esa palabra y se lo hice saber, no sin recordarle lo que ella misma había dicho hace unos días sobre el misticismo de la gracia, el esbelto reflejo que surge de la renuncia al, aman al amaneramiento de la conciencia, mi mujer dijo que yo le daba demasiada importancia a las palabras y que no debería tomarme en serio sus divagaciones. Sobre todo, dijo, porque a ella no le importa el significado de lo que se le ocurre. Solo voy ensartando ideas, como quien mete cuentas de colores en un hilo, dijo, siguiendo solo un criterio intuitivo, como en un juego infantil de combinaciones. Esa es la gracia, dijo. Como la gracia de las marionetas que no necesitan de voluntad para moverse de acuerdo a la geometría más elemental. El significado de las cosas es un accidente, un sobrante. Lo único que importa de verdad es la geometría, el círculo, el cuadrado, el triángulo, la línea y el punto. No hay más misterio. De acuerdo, pienso ahora, asomado a la ventana mientras los perros ladran, pero eso no quita que número cuatro sea, en cierto modo, como una marioneta, imbuida de gracia. Hay dos voluntarias besándose junto a la fuente de piedra. Número uno y número dos, me parece. Today I showed my wife the transcriptions and she remarked offhandedly that they had their grace. 
I thought it odd that she chose that word, and I told her so, reminding her what she herself said a few days ago about the mysticism of grace, the slender reflection cast back when the affectations of consciousness are shed. My wife said I overestimate language, that I take her digressions too seriously. Especially, she said, since she's indifferent to the meaning of whatever it occurs to her to say. I'm just threading together ideas, like someone adding colored beads to a string, she said, following only an intuitive criteria, like in a child's matching game. That's what grace is, she says, like the grace of a marionette, which even lacking will can move in accordance with the most basic geometry. Meaning is an accident, a surplus. The only thing that really matters is geometry, circle, square, triangle, line, point, there's no more mystery to it than that. Fine, I think now, looking out the window as the dogs bark, but the fact remains that number four is in some way a marionette imbued with grace. There are two participants kissing next to the fountain, numbers one and two, I think. Now we're gonna jump to section 17. It's a short one. Mientras número cuatro se prueba los vestidos que le traje esta mañana, le pregunto qué tipo de educación ha recibido. Ella contesta desde detrás de un biombo que no pudo terminar la universidad. Yo la escucho sentado en una silla de madera junto al ventanal de su habitación por donde se ve el jardín. Tuve que abandonar la carrera cuando me quedé embarazada, dice. Yo vivía sola con mi mamá. Mi papá se había muerto. Mi mamá me echó de la casa y me tuve que poner a trabajar desde muy jovencita para mantener a mi hija. Así que no estudio nada. Nada, responde. Un par de semestres de derecho. Usted no es una mujer inculta, le digo. Esas cosas se notan. Entonces, la mujer sale de detrás del biombo. Su cuerpo macizo, muy bien entallado por uno de los vestidos favoritos de mi mujer. Ese le queda perfecto, digo. En la noche, después de la sesión, paso por aquí a buscarla. Procure estar lista. No quiero llegar tarde. Well, number four tries on the dresses I brought in for her this morning. I ask what kind of education she received. She responds from behind the screen that she wasn't able to finish college. I'm in the wooden chair next to the picture window in her room through which the garden is visible. I had to stop studying when I got pregnant, she says. I was living alone with my mom. My dad had died. My mom kicked me out and I had to find work right away to support my daughter. So you didn't study at all? No, not really, she says, a couple semesters of law. You're not an uncultured woman, I say. One notices these things. When she comes out from behind the screen, then she comes out from behind the screen in one of my wife's favorite dresses, which fits her sound body so well, it looks like it could have been made for her. That suits you very nicely, I say. I'll come by for you after the session tonight. Try to be ready. I don't want to be late. And the last, ta the last one, I presume, uh, 18. Um, mi mujer trata de no parecer sorprendida cuando nos ve entrar por la puerta de la galería, pero los ojos casi le dan vueltas en el instante en que reconoce el vestido. La suave y fina tela de color verde acentuando las formas generosas de número cuatro que empieza a pasearse alegremente entre las sutiles piezas. Su sola presencia como un desafío grosero a los leves palitos que penden del techo, casi como flotando en el vacío, a los jirones de costales, a los fragmentos de metal hábilmente ensamblados con los restos de una silla vieja puesta patas arriba, a las desvaídas acuarelas geométricas que bostezan en las paredes. Me pareció que ibas a disfrutar con el contraste, le digo a mi mujer. Ella produce una sonrisa forzada. Desde luego, no me esperaba algo así, dice, y me da un beso tratando de mantener el buen humor y el entusiasmo. Nos interrumpen varios lambones que vienen a felicitarla. ¿Te gusta que la haya traído? Pregunto cuando nos vuelven a dejar solos. Mi mujer se lo piensa, intenta leer mis intenciones, hacerse un dibujo general de la situación. Sí, dice, me gusta. No entiendo nada, pero me gusta. Ahora, si lo que querías era mejorar la inauguración, lo has conseguido. Los movimientos desprevenidos de número cuatro por la sala llaman la atención de los presentes. 
Te traje otro regalo, le digo, y le entrego una dosis. ¿Es la nueva? Pregunta mi mujer. Asiento satisfecho. Ella se lleva la pastilla a la boca, baja con un sorbo de whisky. Te quiero, dice. Me da otro beso y corre a buscar a número cuatro. La saluda, la agarra de las manos. No sé qué le estará diciendo, menos qué le podrá contestar la otra. De repente, las dos carcajadas se entreveran antes de caer en un mismo reguero de cosas quebradas. My wife tries not to look surprised when we come through the gallery door, but her eyes appear to roll back in her head the moment she recognizes the dress, the fine green fabric accentuating number four's generous form as she wanders joyfully among the understated pieces. Her presence alone is a gross challenge to the twigs and strips of canvas that dangle as if afloat in the void, the bits of metal skillfully joined to the remains of an overturned chair, the geometric watercolors pallid and yawning on the walls. I thought you might enjoy the contrast, I say to my wife. She manufactures a smile. I'm certainly quite a surprise, she says, and kisses me, trying hard to maintain her excitement. We're interrupted by a band of sycophants come to congratulate her. Are you glad I brought her? I ask when they've left us alone. My wife considers the question, tries to read my intentions, makes a general sketch of the situation. Yes, she says, I'm happy. I can't say I understand it, but I'm happy. Now, if what you wanted to do was make the opening more interesting, you've succeeded, she adds. Number four's unstudied path through the room has drawn the attention of everyone in it. I brought something else for you too, I say, placing a dose in her hand. Is it the new one? My wife asks. She gives me a satisfied smile, brings the pill to her mouth, swallows it with a sip of whiskey. I love you, she says. Another kiss and she's off to find number four. She greets her warmly, takes both her hands. I have no idea what she's saying, much less how number four will respond. Then two peals of laughter rise briefly above the din before landing in a ditch with the other broken things. All right. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Juan. It's Thank always you. wonderful Thank you. to read um, that way with you. I love, I love that. I, I really love, I really love hearing you. It just sounds so <laughs> a lot more beautiful in English. I'm, I'm serious. You know, I'm serious when I say this. Well, I know you're serious, but I would also say that I feel the same way about you reading in Spanish. <laughs> so I guess we'll have to arm wrestle for it or something. <laughs> Um, uh, I guess the first question that I had for you was, um, well, I'll preface it by saying that when your agent sent us the book, your wonderful agent, she described it as an exploration of art um, as a field for the examination of evil. And I think that's a pretty accurate description. These characters have very few redeeming qualities. They have very few relationships that feel genuine and I'm here they are a bunch of jerks right <laughs> <laughs> who you empathized with or related to when you were writing um if you felt emotional attachment to anyone and how you decided to use these characters as, as vehicles in this way I guess that's a, a three-part question so you can take it as you want to <laughs> well that well, that's there was a there was a very generous description by my agent um, I think it's uh, I think it's accurate, uh, but it wasn't at all my intention to explore evil at all. Uh, but I was more interested in thinking about art and its relationship to drugs. You know the metaphor of drugs. You know I'm I'm Colombian, so we are absolutely or or country or recent history is absolutely better, you know, marked by this, by this, this phenomena, you know? So I was trying to, I was trying to deal with all these aspects of drugs that normally we don't uh, see portrayed in anywhere else, you know, like, um, for instance, all these intellectual aspects of what the metaphor of drugs are, are implying for contemporary society everywhere, not only Colombia, but everywhere, you know? Drugs are very important in, in contemporary society. I mean, I would say 
drugs and capitalism are just kind of a, a, a very entangled phenomena. I would say it's, it's the, the same phenomena. So my, my novel was oriented initially to explore these questions. Um, but I think eventually, probably because of all these characters that I created, I don't know why, because I, normally many of the people I've met in the art world are not such a jerk, you know, such, such, such evil people. They're, they're not like that. I mean, many, my, most, <laughs> uh, I have like many, many friends, artists, curators and writers and everything else, but and they're not like that, you know, but, but, but. But of course, I've seen a lot of environments that may resemble this, 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 you know, atmospheres that I've created in the, in the novel. I work for, I work for an, for an art gallery in Spain for, for a couple of years, and I worked for an art magazine. So I had the chance for many time to be in touch with a lot of people who behave like this. And so I kind of, I was. I, in, I wasn't intentionally making this ethnographic work while I was working with, with this, you know, uh, with these people, but I, I guess this is something that a writer just does by by default, and so, uh, so, and uh, and eventually I I well, I think the novel was just formed itself after this very simple premises. I was, I kept exploring all these different details and problems that, that you know, the, the novel was dealing with. So I don't know if I'm answering you at all, but can I ask you a question? Oh, well, all right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's sort of a ping pong. It's not like a, you know, one direction. So I, I really, I was really curious because I, as I was listening to you right now, uh, your translation has a very, um, I would say, a, it's got a poetic tone to it. It's got a, it's got a, and and I know you, you are a poet. You come from 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 this environment. You you you've been translating poetry for so long, and uh, and I and I think that this is a very. Uh, this is like a very particular thing, you know. It's not very common that 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 translators have this sensibility for, for for poetry like you do. So I really I was really wondering if you have ever you know created any sort of theory about how poetry just had an influence in your work or. or... Oh, that's such a great question. Mm -hmm. I I can't say that I have created a theory about the way poetry has influenced my translation work, but I think coming from a, a poetic background and having spent so much time translating poetry, um, that was definitely something that I thought about a lot, especially as I was translating number four's sections, which I feel operate so much more at a poetic level and, a, and at the level of sound and music rather than simply at the level of, of meaning. <laughs> and I think I actually, I had a kind of variation on that question to ask you because I feel like <laughs> writing um, draws so much on musicality and on poetry, unless I've just projected that onto, onto it in my translation. Um, and, and so I think, I do think a lot about sound and music and rhythm and all of those kind of minute details of language as I'm translating, just because that's always been those permutations have always been most interesting to me as a writer. So when I'm translating, I, I can't help but approach it from that perspective. Um, and you have such a beautiful and musical way of writing that that's why I get so much enjoyment out of translating your work, because I hear so much music in it. So my question for you <laughs> was kind of how music ah plays a role in your writing process. I, I, I actually really wanted to ask you as I was translating what music you were listening to when you wrote number four's sections, because they have this dissonance to them um, that I find really entrancing. But I, I never asked because I wanted to get it right before I went back to you for, with questions. <laughs> but I would be curious to hear just about that relationship 
And I know you've written poetry as well. So maybe I'll fire back at the same question. <laughs> I am, I'm just a very frustrated poet. And, I'm, and I really mean it. I mean, I, I, I well, I, right after I started making novels, I realized the only way I could possibly go, the closest I could get to poetry was, you know, writing all these little novels I was, ma I was doing. Like, uh, because all my novels are very short and they're almost like little, you know, poetry books, like uh, very thin books. And, uh, and I really like that, you know? I like the short chapters, very concentrated ideas, and the language almost uh, creating all this sliding between concepts and, and noise, you know? Mm -hmm. I like this idea of noise rather than music, mm -hmm. um, because music is a very, I would say, militarized notion of, of you know, like uh, trying to organize sound in a very, uh, precise. I mean, you you know I love music, but but I I'd rather I'd rather think uh, about my work as noise, uh -huh. not so mu not so much as music. And um, so in that sense, I was I was listening to a lot of noise back in those days, uh, and I still do. I mean, I, I I think a couple of days a week I just start listening. I don't know, like a lot of contemporary music from the early twentieth century. And I don't know, or something like, um, but, but there, was, there was this specific piece I, I used to listen to back in those days. Uh, and it's a piece by, by um, uh, Morton Feldman. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, it's called Crippled Symmetry. And that's exactly the name of one of the chapters. It's Symmetria Chueca. And uh, How yeah, could and- How uh, discuss this until now? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but, but, you know, crippled symmetry, it's not, you know, it's a very free translation, symmetria chueca, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but it's, it comes from there, it comes from, it comes from this piece by Morton Feldman, um, which is a very, like, Morton Feldman pieces are, you know, the very repet repetitions and this, you know, it, it, the sounds which you're immersed into by, by this uh, layers and layers of repetition, which is kind of a very beautiful way to immerse yourself in, into to this noise, you know, this. So that's, uh, that's yeah, I never told you this. I can't I, I, I never told you this. <laughs> Especially because I feel like that idea of repetition with difference is one of the things that I find most compelling about translation and about poetry too. So I, I probably should have uh, listened to that piece while I was translating that section, but next time, I guess. But, but, you, but you know why I didn't tell you this? Because I completely forgot it. <laughs> Good. Yeah, believe, believe me. Otherwise, I would, I would have tell you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what music were you listening to when, when you were doing this, this translation? Oh, God, I was listening. I was listening to a lot of Galician folk music, so I don't know if that was informing my translation at all, but that's a very good question. I, I want to get back to this idea that you kind of said that the book wrote itself after you had these concepts in place, and I was curious about how that relates to the idea of grace in, in the artistic process of the doctor's wife. I mean, we hear a lot about grace it's a recurring concept throughout the book. Um, but even in the section we just read, we hear this idea that meaning is an accident or a surplus. And that the yeah. wife is, she's in, this artist is indifferent to the meaning of whatever it occurs to her to say. And so I'm curious, we kind of get both sides of this discussion of, of grace as part of an artistic process. And I'm wondering if it plays into your writing process. Um, or if not. <laughs> well, this, this whole thing of grace comes from a little essay by, by Kleist, Heinrich von Kleist. He's this, you know, this poet uh, from the 18th century. You know, he died like he, when he was like 20 years old or something. He committed suicide with, her, with his girlfriend. Very romantic thing, you know, back in those days. 
but he was he was a he he was a complete genius. He he just he was very influential on Kafka, for for example. Many of his short stories are very influential and had a very profound impact on on Kafka. And if you read those stories, such there's one this. Uh, um, I just don't remember the name in English right now, but 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 there's this little piece, uh, this little essay he has on on marionettes, and um, and it's a beautiful text because he says that that um, it's just a couple of friends uh, meet in in a park or in a in a square, and and they just see this um, street artist, this marionette artist. And one of them starts to create, you know, out of nothing, this theory of, of movement and of grace. And he says, and he says that we should aspire, human, human body should aspire to the movement of marionettes because, uh, it, you know, all the grace of the marionette movement comes from its lack of will. They have no conscience. So they just obey these very straight lines, these geometric lines, and and so that's the gracefulness comes from the it's you know they don't think, so they don't need to think, they mm -hmm. just obey the Mary you know the you know and and it's a very very beautiful book because essay because in the end it just all becomes a reflection on the uh, theological aspects of 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 movement and geometry so this this essay by Kleist was very very you know key i would say it's like it's like a very it's operating there everywhere and in, in these little chapters we, we we just read mm -hmm. it's you know there's scattered all over the this reference to to Kleist's text uh so that's that's where it, it all comes from I agree. Uh, so i I really, I really just wanted to to explore this, this what would happen in contemporary world. This, you know, because all these ideas are just there, you know. Uh, right now, it's just the, the essence of robotics. Right now, you know, posthumanism things, questions are just floating there. So I really was interested in letting all these things fall uh, all over the the text. So. I love all of this so much. And I have to say, I can't believe, once again, I can't believe we didn't discuss this. <laughs> well, it, was <laughs> it kind of makes me, I, um, I wonder how we, how we did it. <laughs> because we didn't, <laughs> we didn't seem like such, do you feel, I guess my question is more, I know that you've done a lot of translating yourself um, did you feel when we were collaborating that you were going to have kind of a hands-off approach and not share these fundamental details? Were there things that if I would have asked you about, maybe we would have discussed them or were you kind of just waiting to see what happened? <laughs> well, as, as well, we're friends, you know me, so I love accidents, you know, I really love, I really love trans, translation accidents even. And um, and I was really prepared to receive any kind of accidents that would come from your your translation. But miraculously, what I was really amazed at the way you know you, you just had this. It really seemed like a, you really treat me like a marionette. I would say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so and now. And in a in, in the most graceful way, that's you know that was just gracefulness <laughs> at its top. So uh, <laughs> and I was really happy, you know. And I and I wrote and I wrote to you immediately once I finished reading, and I was like, "Whoa, what the hell happened?" Like, <laughs> like uh, yeah, really, you know. <laughs> oh, I just so. <laughs> So that was that was that was a really cool experience for me, like, uh, and uh, because somehow I I realized you had like, like um, you had appropriated the text in the best way possible, you know, and I love it because that's exactly what I do when I translate. 
Ah, you know? okay. Well. <laughs> That's precisely what I do. So, uh, um, and I really loved it because, because it, you had this, this very, for, for people who, who understand spot languages, it maybe was uh, easy to see how Lizzie just turns the syntax upside down in many phrases like uh and and but mysteriously it's it's pretty much like listening english but english has been contaminated by spanish you know in a very beautiful way We're it's still it's right i mean it's you know that's that's what translation is all about i think you know this this very subtle contamination between languages you, you're still reading in your own language because the translator just translated for you, but somehow many of the music, the movement, the something mysterious from coming from the other language just instills in the in the, the translation. So I think I was really amazed when I when I read the, your your work because I was like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> from now on, from now on, let's do it all together, please. <laughs> Way. <laughs> I'm just so, I mean, this question of, ne for the next book, I'll ask you a lot more questions up front, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, try not to, I'll try not to forget all these, these little details and references and everything else, you know. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, what do you think? Should we uh, take some questions from the audience? Sure. Yeah. Um, it seems like what just happened addressed um, a question that has come up in different forms in the chat about what your co collaboration looked like and um, what it meant for both of you to be translators working in opposite directions, working together. Um, that's really, really fascinating. Um, there's a question from Emma that I think is on all of our minds. Will there be more? Um, <laughs> Are Juan's other novels going to be available in Lizzie's translations soon? <laughs> should I should I answer or, or or are we allowed to know? Is this the... I think our plan is to collaborate forever, right? <laughs> I think that's well, what we're hoping to hear. Yeah, that's 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 our plan, and 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 I'm I'm gonna struggle so we we can keep doing this, <laughs> like like hopefully. It will. Won't be too much of a struggle. <laughs> but 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 I'll return you the favor translating your things into Spanish. Oh my god, <laughs> that's new. <laughs> it's a it's a ping pong. I told you. Perfect deal. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad it was decided here. Um, so I guess we we sort of heard a, a bit about what your collaboration didn't look like, honestly. Um, but could you guys go more into detail about um, how you did work together, what it looked like, and how you, um, I don't know, how you came to see eye to eye, how it all worked? Well, I was very, I had decided that I was not going to share my translation with Juan until I thought that it was as finished as it could possibly be. So I really avoided, I, I, I guess I could go back in time a little bit and say that we met pretty spontaneously and serendipitously at the Medellin Book Fair um, in 2017. And I always tell this story, but Juan said that he was best friends with a bunch of different coffeehouse authors. And at that point, I didn't even know you were a writer yourself, Juan. I don't know how you left that out. You're so modest. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ultimately came back to the office and found that we had these incredible novels from him on submission from his agent. So it was, um, that's where the collaboration began, I guess. And then what else happened? <laughs> well, we, we, we had this, this, uh, a lot of conversations back in this, this Medellin fair. Mm -hmm. And I realized we had a lot in common, like uh, literal, you know, we had this same poetry background interest and everything. So, and, uh, and Lizzie is, Lizzie is incredible. I mean, Lizzie is just a very intellectual, from an intellectual point of view, she's like so, so sophisticated, 
and 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 it, no, really, I'm not, I, I don't know how to say this, uh, but but you know, it's not. Uh, many translators are just a very efficient people, great people, awesome people, but you're also an author. You're also you know you're also a, a creator. So for me, it was like a you know, it was more like a partnership thing. Uh, rather than a, rela a typical relation between translator and uh, an author, I would say. I felt that way too. Thank you, Juan. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly it's a, it's a great relationship and I think we're all very happy to have gotten to be a part of it for at least 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Melissa has a question um, for Juan about um, his life as a writer and his life as a translator um, and how much they inform one another and how much they overlap, how separate they are. Um, we heard a bit about Lizzie's sort of overlap as poet, translator, translator, poet, and translator of poetry. Um, so Juan, would you like to elaborate a bit about the intersections you see in your own writing and how translation informs it? Well, I, I would say for me, translating has been like a very, it's been like a school for me, for, for my own writing. Like, um, um, I would say almost everything I know, I owe it to translating a lot of brilliant uh, texts, brilliant writers. So for me, they definitely overlap. And in many cases, I would say, uh, you you mentioned um, uh, Thomas Wolfe er, earlier, and uh, translating some of some of his books, short novels, for me was a was an adventure, really. And I, in many many pages, I really forgot I was translating. Really, I mean, I was so transported by by his writing, and so. I was I was in a sort of a um, I don't know I was it was from a conscious point of view it, it's it's really mysterious like uh you 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 I don't have the memory of translating this guy you know and because uh, I was almost like writing it's uh, his 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 work and um, but that's his, th that's an exceptional experience of course you know of course have done. So many right, uh, so many translations. I didn't enjoy that much, and I really remember doing those. And um, but but you know, even the ones you don't like doing that much, they're they're just a uh, they're just a very um, educational experience. Uh, I would say, yeah. Right. I guess I guess I would say that I was a little bit surprised even to see the list of authors you had translated when looking at this text because they actually do seem very disparate you know they're um this isn't really a wolfian text it isn't a faulknerian text it's um it's not machado Giussi's. um and speaking of i guess I, i'd be curious to know both of your perspectives on the question of brevity in this text i think at least for me it's a novel that's really served by how slight it is and how lean the prose is. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing both of you elaborate further on what it means to produce short fiction in this context. Um, do you want to say something, Lizzie? No, I'm sorry, I'm you. You can't talk because we're on a computer screen. <laughs> um, well, uh, I don't like writing long novels. I don't enjoy it. There's, there's, a, there's this thing about, I, I mean, I love reading them, but not, not writing them. Maybe because of this relationship to art and poetry, I would say. Like, um, for me, this, uh, the, the form of the novel is closer to, right now should be closer at least, to to the forms coming from poetry or contemporary art or even contemporary music, and this sort of of you know short novels, this this form really works for me 
in order to um, to offer this this um, this experience of 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 time, you know, because if, in the end, a, a novel is is a is a very particular experience of time, and you experience time in a very different way when you're reading a long, long novel. You sort of move to that novel, you, you know, just like a uh, you you make it your own house and you know just just go to live there, but. Um, in a short novel, the experience is very different. You know, the idea of of, of time, the, the the very experience of time in a short novel, and I'm really interested in exploring that. And I'm saying this this in a very vague way, I know, because that's because I, for me, it's a very intuitive uh, experience. It's it's very. I don't have like a concept uh, created about this. It's just it's just an intuition I have about the duration, you know, how, how long a novel should, should be. Uh, I don't know. That's all I can say about that. And, and Lizzie, do you have um, anything to add about the question of the, the short novel, particularly this one, working with this one? Nothing to add, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess another question that I had is about, um, the issue of, of translation, bringing your work into the Anglophone market, um, there's always sort of a question of like essentialism, I think that happens when a work is translated that, you know, you go from being the author of this novel to being, you know, a Latin American author or a Colombian author. And that is expected to mean something to readers. Um, something that I appreciate as a reader from Coffeehouse Press in particular is all the work they do to like break down the monolith of, of our perspectives of Latin American literature. But I guess my question is, now that, you've, now that you exist in the Anglophone sphere, how do you understand your own role, your own place within what we think of as Latin American literature? Do you, do you think about that at all or? I really don't think about that at all. Mm. Uh, I, I am a Latin American author, and uh, that means, Latin, being a Latin American author means also a Spanish speaking author. You know, um, um, so my universe of references, my constellation of, uh, the constellation of authors I'm working with, and uh, my idea of how would I like to, where I would like to operate as an author is completely Latin American. I, I, really, don't, I really don't see myself like um, being part of this, this, I don't know, like um, international star system of, of authors, you know? I know that's 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 a very accidental phenomenon as well. You know, you don't plan those things many many times. Like it, those things happen to you many times, in many cases. I mean, but but that's not my intention as an author. My intention as an author is keep working in the realms of Spanish uh, language. My tradition is Spanish, and it's a, it's a huge it's a huge tradition uh, with. Um, with a very, I would say, I would say it's, 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 I mean, being a part of that tradition for me is an honor, you know? Uh, but, but at the same time, as I said before, I love accidents. And, um, and the fact that I'm here talking to you guys, for me, it's, it's great. I mean, new readers um, and uh, a lot of, possibilities in terms of types of reading coming from from the United States you know and so far that's been the experience I mean obtaining a lot of feedback that otherwise wouldn't have come uh, so I really appreciate it I'm really I'm really happy you know I'm really really happy this is for me like a like a like an extra gift coming from the States you know like uh, and I'm really happy it's just really happy to to have new readers and being able to obtain new feedback, radically new feedback. So awesome. 
Wonderful. Um, so if there aren't any other questions from anybody, um, I will simply encourage you to pick up a copy of Ornamental. There's a link in the chat where you can place an order. Um, and I'd like to once again thank Juan and Lizzie for doing this for us. It was a real joy. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you. It's been thank, a pleasure. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Really grateful to you thank. and everyone at Malaprops. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Coffee, uh, coffee house constituency here. Hi, Julieta and Daly. <laughs> hey, Daly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really had a great time today. So did I. So, Thank you. See ya.